There is a lot to see at the Stanek Gallery this month as it presents People, Places, and Things. Its first photo exhibition, curated by legendary gallerist Sandy Webster Brantley, and I was in the gallery business for 42 years, from 1969, and we closed the gallery in 2011. And everything that I was told I couldn't do, I did. I hear you have black artists in your gallery. And I said, well, we have good artists. Some of them happen to be black. Well, don't you know you can't do that? I said, what are you talking about? Well, if black people come, white people will never come. Well, we live to say, nya, 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 nya. People, Places, and Things showcases 10 photographers, and I got to speak to seven of them, including one who took my picture years ago when I was filming a show at the Center for Art in Wood. My name's William Williams, and I have two photographs. They both relate to African-American history. Post-Civil War, the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial, 54th Massachusetts on Boston Common, where that regiment marched by the State House where Frederick Douglass was in attendance on their way south. What I decided to do is not photograph the monument the way it's normally photographed with Augustus St. Gaudens, Relief of the Soldiers, but to photograph from the rear, and that's where those soldiers' names were added much, much later. Originally, their names were not on the monument, simply Shaw's name as the commander of the 54th. There was a large number of veterans that contributed to that monument. Very much a biracial monument, considered by many to be the greatest 19th century sculpture in America. And then the other photograph is Fort Barrancas, which is in Florida. And that fort was built by a company of highly skilled enslaved laborers. Just imagine those skilled hands putting all those bricks together and that they're still there. That was pretty amazing to me. Later, two black regiments were stationed there that fought in the Civil War battles in Florida. In both cases, I'm working with light, the exterior light on Boston Common, and then the interior light as it's filtered through those little windows in the fort. That's what gives it that long recessional, and then you finally get to, there's a little point at the end of light, so you go through the whole thing. So that's the pairing, both monuments to African-American participation and heroism in the Civil War. My name is Andrew Cowens, I'm painter, photographer. The works in this show range from 1958 until the present day, and they're mostly portraits. Muhammad Ali and Stevie Wonder was shot in 1975 at Ali's birthday party in Chicago. I ended up taking a picture of Diana Carroll because I did a job for Red Book. We routed her home that summer on Fire Island. The picture of Mick Jagger was shot in Brazil in 1968. I met him at a pool and then later on he said, you know, we're going to Bahia. I said, we're going to Bahia too. So we went together and when we were letting him out of the cab, he said, they don't have my reservation. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So my sister said, well, we have another house. Would you like to stay there? And he said, yeah. So that's how I got to see him every day. We hung out and read books and everything. Melvin Van Peoples. And I like that picture in particular because we're looking at his reflection that he's looking at. So it's a double portrait. We see what he sees. The Egg Nude, which I shot one of my earliest pictures in 1958. I never really worked that much commercially. I did magazine stuff. But in 1969, I got involved in the movie world. Well, I've done over 30 films. What? Still photography on The Way We Were, The Eyes of Our Mars, Dirty Dancing, Boomerang, Juice, on Golden Pond. 31 films. What were they like? Nice. Henry Fonda was terrific. Jane Fonda was great, and Catherine Hepburn was the dream. My name is Ron Tarver. My dad was a photographer back in the 40s and 50s. So I've taken his work and reinterpreted it to make comments on the world today. A lot of it involves collage, incorporating some of my images with his images. Hopefully these works will continue to live on. 
The big one took me about two years to <laughs> a composition for that piece of an image that I found in my dad's work of these three people that look like they're homesteaders. They look like they just came off of a cattle drive or they came off of the Dust Bowl. I thought with just the political climate and with the way immigrants have been treated, I thought, what can I do with this image? And I thought, well, you know, this family looks like they could have left the earth and they landed on this forbidden planet, the scene of chaos and desolation, but maybe a little bit of hope sprinkled in there. So it's this built scene of images that range everywhere from my dad's work to images that I appropriated from the internet to actually the inside of seashells to uh, create the landscape. In the show there's an image called Black Cotton. I wanted to make a comment on slavery and how cotton was not only considered material of commerce but it was also a material of enslavement and toil and labor. And so I replaced the uh, cotton with black hair to get at that idea that cotton built this country, but also slavery built this country. Hi, my name's Ada Luisa Trillo. I'm a Mexican-American artist. And my work is documentary photography of women in low-end prostitution. I feel that it's important to bring awareness to this group of women because it doesn't happen only in Mexico. It happens also in Philadelphia, such as in the Kensington district where I also work and volunteer. My work is not pretty, but it's meant to give you a reality of what's going on in the world around you. The relationship has been for almost four years, traveling three and four times a year to Mexico and meeting with the women, spending time with them, talking to them, working with the women that help them get out of drugs, and going with them to see other women. So that also allows me uh, an in. There's trust from some women, and then those women trust me more, and then it starts building a little community. Coco started at the age of 13. Her mother sold her, and under international law, she will always be considered a sex-traded victim, despite the fact that she is now 64. She was sold, period. Many of these girls, their life expectancy is around 34 to 28 years old. So Coco's 64, and you look at her eyes, she's resilient. She's not bitter. She's not happy, she's not indifferent, she's resilient because she's a survivor. She made it through hell because that atmosphere is just hell and she still survived. There's a group of nuns, the only organization in Juarez that actually helps these women get sober, find jobs and bring their kids with them to the safe houses. Their rehabs are $500 to get a heroin uh, detox, which is incredibly cheap if you consider it to what in the United States a heroin detox cost. So I was mostly helping in, the, in, in Mexico because these are the women, these are my people, but then I started working in Kensington and now part of the proceeds are gonna go to Kensington as well because I started a program there. I'm Bob Reinhardt and I have four black and white photographs. The work is titled End of Days, and when I started this series last fall, things politically were not quite the same as they are now. And places like the EPA had more control, but as they lose that and we are in danger of damaging the planet a little bit more, unfortunately my images are becoming reality, and that was not my intention. The process, the basic image, is direct, straight from the camera. And then I use about two or three phone apps and Photoshop to manipulate. Most of them have been flooded. And then from there, the reflections are distorted. And then I distort the focus, the saturation, anything to distress it and give the appearance that things in terms of the environment have changed and shifted for the worst. Most of the images I take now are with my iPhone. The security that if I'm in an area, and often some of these places are not in great areas, to kind of slip into my pocket and I'm not carrying around my big Nikon with the expensive lens. I'd like to be an optimist about being a pessimist. <laughs> That's not very, <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm an optimist that we'll get through this. Yeah, together as a community.
Hello, my name is Tony Ward. The premise of the Tableau Vivant pictures is based on a 19th century theme. They didn't have television, they didn't have radio or the internet. So they created these ways of entertaining themselves through theater games. Tableau Vivant means a living picture. And that fascinated me, so I started to create a cast of characters. People would come through my studio and I would do some portraits of them, make notes in my notebook about the events like sexual harassment, which is called Me Too now, but it was 20 years ago it was sexual harassment. I started to pick up these tendencies in our culture and I used the tableau vivant as a way to express some of the things that I was observing in culture. So the diptych happened by accident. It wasn't like it was planned to be a diptych. But when I drove up to Lancaster with my cast of characters, which included a fashion designer from Philly who supplied the fashion for the model, Holly Singlin, who was a local model I found uh, here in town. We had precast an old rare bookstore. And I'm always intrigued by old environments that have certain characteristics to them. I started to set up the shot and I remember there was that checkerboard floor and I did a precast of the model, put her in the garment and then she went away for a minute. Then I said, oh, why don't you come back and let's try that shot with you nude. So then I took the shot of her nude first and then I said, okay, now we'll put the garment on and do that. And so it was like this kind of theater game, you know, about between nudity and dressed and being undressed. And then the other players, a woman who was a bodybuilder, we're still friends, her name's Tenley Ammerman. And I made the designer of the fashion the uh, merchant that was in the store. So he was kind of like selling this dress, but it was all like a pinup fantasy uh, in the way. There's always this kind of underpinning in our culture uh, with how we approach women. And a lot of men make the fatal mistake under certain assumptions that they can come on to a woman and be provocative without any repercussions, and that's wrong. So the way I've worked with the nude as a way to address this issue is I always have a precasting with my subjects, and we have a conversation about very specifically what we're going to do. And if there's any limit to the extent to which we express her nudity, that will be written down in a contract. This is why people get into trouble. If you just strip it down to a man and how they're approaching a woman, has to have some sort of paper trail if nudity is involved, because it deals with the issue of privacy. I'm Andrea Baldeck, a lifelong lover of photography who came to this as a second or third career after music and medicine. I was an anesthesiologist and I decided to exchange the operating room for the dark room because in the dark room it's a lot quieter and more serene. You don't have issues of life and death and if a mistake is made, no one is harmed. I fell in love with photography when, as a very small child, my parents took me to the George Eastman House, the uh, Museum of Photography in Rochester. I fell in love with black and white photography. Being true to my roots, or maybe showing my age, I still shoot film and do all of my own darkroom work. I love the immersive process. Gloves are satin. I love the notion of gesture and that you could communicate a lot without needing a human model. And at the time, I didn't have one available. So I wanted to suggest feelings, ideas, lifestyle perhaps, and to run the gambit between luxury and um, artifice and to enjoy also the play of light on these gloves and to allow the viewer to think about the magician in the top hat, the appearance at the ball, even all of the white glove important people at a certain state affairs, how they might act and how if you had the chance to put on those gloves you would flaunt them or pretend in them and otherwise act out your imagination. One of the real challenges of photography to create enough of an illusion that you get a connection with your viewer and then they have a chance to take away hopefully something meaningful and memorable and lasting. Three of the photographers could not make the opening. His Wikipedia entry says 
Donald Camp is notable for his portraits that explore the dignity and nobility that can be found in the human face, particularly those of African American men. Camp's unique printing methods are based on early 19th century non-silver photographic processes. He has adapted these processes to use photosensitized casein and earth pigments, essentially dust, to produce his photographs. His work has been collected by the Philadelphia Museum of Art and the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. In a catalog for a 1990 show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Camp wrote, Light is a metaphor for the spirit. The foundation of vision is the introduction of light into its absence. This relationship allows light to become a tool that can explore the theme, voids, and barriers. Tones, values, shapes, and masses of light are used to establish a juxtaposition of remoteness and proximity. Or, as stated in Baha'i text, indications of both the light of reunion and the fire of separation. Don Camp does a very special printing of his photography, but nobody else does that kind of thing. And when uh, he first came to the gallery, he took a picture of me and of my husband, James Brantley. And I think at that time they were retailing for $1,000. And now you see they're retailing for $20,000. So I guess he's doing okay. Arlene Love goes out on the street and takes pictures of people mostly who are eating or walking around or hugging or kissing. I asked her, do you think you'd be allowed to show those pictures because you're not getting an okay from the people? And it's anything that you do in public is public. So whatever pictures she takes are okay to be shown. Arlene Love started out as a sculptor but began doing photography during a trip to Mexico. She wrote, my work, regardless of medium, has always focused on depiction of the human image. It speaks back to us of our own vulnerability and humanity. Until recently, street photography and candid portraits were my sole passion. I never asked permission. I wanted the person without his or her mask. The present is just an illusion. Anthony Barbosa, he's a photographer from New York. His work is very, very well known in New York. He does a lot of famous people. There's a Jacob Lawrence out there, which is really incredible. We used to do the National Black Fine Art Show in New York, and that's how I got to a couple of the photographers through that show. And I'm very proud when I come and look at the show and I look at his work. He's more wonderful now even than when he came to the gallery those many years ago. Anthony Barboza is a self-taught photographer whose career began in 1964. He opened a commercial studio in 1969 and has been creating photos for advertising and editorial spreads for high-profile publications for over three decades and his portraits of prominent creative people are simply amazing. Well, there you go. 10 photographers in their terrific People, Places and Things show. But wait! There's another photographer and a painter in the back room. And unlike the main show, these guys get to use color. Hi, my name is Scott Farrell. I'm a photographer who lives on Long Island. I look for organic landscapes within a wall, sand, a beach, or in the case uh, with the Stanek Gallery here, my dry documentaries are all photographs from various boat yards and marinas across Maine, Cape Cod, North and South Shores of Long Island. 
I'll walk around boat yards and I'll see a particular image or a series of colors that really bring me back to something that I had experienced earlier in life. My wife and I spent a year and a half in Northern California and just these little splashes of red in between all these blacks and deep blues really brought back those late summer days when the fog starts rolling in and all the poppies are in bloom and you've got, just got all this brilliant red which is the only color in this very monochromatic landscape. I do not Photoshop. I'm not a very technical photographer. I don't manipulate. I don't add anything to my photographs. On occasion I may use a cloning brush or the healing brush tool to take an insect off the surface of what I photographed. But other than that, it's uh, pretty much straight right out of the camera. What I saw is what you get. My name is James Brantley. I'm a permanent resident here at Philadelphia. I've been here 72 years now. And Stanton Gallery has been wise enough to include me in their stable of artists. And my paintings are here now. Those large landscape paintings, those celestial paintings are mine. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have art to do at this stage in my life. It's very, very important in an artist's life. And getting to see wonderful work like this at the Stanek Gallery is very important in an art lover's life. So make sure you catch the show before it ends on May 26th, 2018.